Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, we're going to start now, and I guess all of the other participants are going to be joining and are going to be joining our webinar. Um, for now, I just want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, so hi, Film Initiative members, and also non-members that are actually joining for this seminar and hopefully become GABA Film Initiative members. Um, this is our first webinar, so it's very exciting for us. Um, I hope you're all doing very well during these um, times of change. And also the Film Initiative has gone through a lot of changes, which you will see and hear in the next couple weeks and months. Um, as previously mentioned in our email, we will conduct this webinar in English. Um, all future emails, newsletters, etc., will be written in English. So we ensure that you know speaking uh, English-speaking members are actually feeling welcome and are able to participate. So first things first, I really want to thank our so-called chairman Wolfram Dörke, who should be listening in right now. Um, so thank you for supporting the film initiative. Um, and especially supporting us while transitioning and getting a new leadership and keeping the spirit of the film initiative alive during that time. So thank you Wolfram for that. I also want to welcome and officially introduce Joachim Zell to the film initiative in his new function, as you might have read in the email already. Um, he's going to be co-chairing with me. So most of you know him um, by his nickname, Jay-Z. Jay-Z comes from a technical background working in the field of imaging science and production workflow as a VP technology for eFilm, which who, if in case you don't know the company, it's an industry leading post house that has worked for many um, Academy Award winning films and television shows. So Joachim is gonna be co-chair um, together with me going forward. So if you have any questions or if you have any um, information, if you wanna make a webinar, whatever, you can always talk to me or Joachim. Um, who, for those of you who haven't gotten the chance to talk to me in the last years, my name is Verena Poon. I'm a writer producer that has been involved with TV series and features for um, ProSieben, Set1 in Germany, CNN, Amazon Prime, Netflix, such things. And I've been vice chair of the GABA Film Initiative for about three years. Now, after restructuring our group and after Thomas Veit, our previous chairman, left and is now enjoying um, fatherhood in Germany, JC and I will take on this task together and we're super excited about that. Um, also, I want to welcome and officially welcome Katrin Hager. Most of you know her. She has been working as an event organizer for GABA California since 2012. It's been a long time. And she's also a costume designer for film and television. So she's going to take on the, the new role as marketing communications director for the GABA Film Initiative. So we're absolutely happy to have her. She's been such a support throughout the years already, and now she's going to be a fixture in our team. Today's webinar is, as I said, the first webinar that we're doing. It's a start to get things rolling again. If you have any topics that you would like to hear about, please email me or GZ. I will drop uh, the email in the chat in a little bit. So, uh, or you could always just uh, email and uh, respond to the newsletter that we're sending out. Um, yeah, let us know your thoughts. Now, um, I will hand over to JC. We're at 41 participants right now. So I think we can start rolling and whoever wants to join later can do that. Um, he's gonna guide us through this webinar. Uh, that he and some very, very interesting folks uh, have prepared for us. And I'm excited for, for you to get to know all of these people. They uh, did an incredible job of creating this and um, sharing it with us. So JC, I'm gonna hand this over to you now. Very good. Thank you, Varina. Um, hello, everybody, to our webinar here. So um, we thought we use this first uh, social gathering to um, talk about an example um, technology demonstration we did. We created a mini movie in February. Uh, it started from December to February. We decided to use the latest and greatest and most modern technology. And of course, we used virtual production stages, which might replace the green screen. We did everything in the cloud. And little did we know that two months later, everybody sits at home and we have to do everything in the cloud. So we learned a lot uh, without any pressure. 
we we learned in December uh, up to February already how modern work workflows uh, look like. And today many ask questions, uh, how did you do it? And it's not only me who can answer all these questions. We had an immense support from the industry out there. Uh, 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 the HPA, the Hollywood Professional Association, actually did uh, sponsor and initialize this project. So at the 18th of February in Palm Springs, we gave the presentation. We filmed still in the morning some elements, did edit um, after lunch and color correct and VFX and showed the movie in the evening. So we were very current, uh, very fast, and did everything remotely in the cloud. And for this meeting today that the GABA Film Initiative, the German-American Business Association, uh, uh, is holding this, this event. Uh, Uli, your microphone is still on. Yeah. And <laughs> so that we uh, uh, have this event here, uh, uh, I invited all German-speaking and uh, German-based participants of our project to help uh, uh, to create this event of today. Now I want to show some clips here. At this time, I have to prove how clever I am in terms of operating this computer. Yes, so... The HPA, that's our uh, logo there, the Hollywood Professional Association. You see the picture, right? If this test picture is displayed so on your computer display that you see 13 bars, then the dynamic range is uh, 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 calibrated right. And here I show um, our four locations we were on. Uh, on the left, the ASC Clubhouse, American Society of Cinematographers, um, supported our project a lot. Um, the, this was our first shooting day. Our second shooting day was on the virtual production stage at Lux Machina downtown. It's um, uh, uh, powered by the Epic Games uh, Unreal Engine, the same technology which the Mandalorian is using. Everybody talks about it at the moment. Then we went to the Hollywood Boulevard to Jameson's, that's the HBA clubhouse. So we uh, of course needed Hollywood locations since we are uh, uh, based in Hollywood. And then um, stage four, we had a train set on the stage. It was a 50-50 um, hybrid virtual production stage, which worked very well as well. Um, so, uh, now, don't get worried, I don't wanna show too many charts, but since there are technical people in the room, so we used all high-end cameras available to us. We had many camera operators helping us to um, get the job done there in the camera department and invited Chris today, who, who was our German participant on this project. We used the German ARRI camera. Then we used the LifeGrade product, uh, the development and the main office for LifeGrade and Pomford is in Munich. Um, uh, uh, KinoFlow, uh, Frieda will uh, talk about um, the lighting options we had with the LED lighting. Uh, 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 and then many actors and supporters uh, were from Germany as well. Um, size did provide lenses. Um, so to go on here, uh, uh, so I come to the Alexa camera first. So the Alexa camera was used on our virtual production stage here. And there you see how the background actually moves uh, 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 in front of us. And when you are in this room, it was really an immersive experience. The, when the room moved, you, your body moved automatically with the room. Your brain made you move as well because you, you thought, I'm really in this forest. This cannot be. Uh, uh, perhaps it can be described to a strong earthquake that you're really dizzy and you don't know what's happening. But the amazing part is that this 3D environment uh, 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 helps the camera and the audience to really feel that we are in that forest, the, the trees are all 3D elements. So if the camera moves around, uh, the camera can actually look behind the trees. We had other scenes where there were rocks in the foreground as well. So the camera operator actually can weeks before already put the goggles on 
and uh, walk through the scenery without being on the production stage. Even the actors could actually get used to this area. Actors don't have to travel anymore as well. The whole crew doesn't have to travel anymore. Um, there's, there are some downfalls in terms of frame rate and shutter angle, so we cannot do everything like high speed footage, but now that we all have to um, be more efficient and travel less, that's an amazing um, uh, uh, opportunity actually to, to get the film industry back and get movies, um, uh, movie making back on. So there I want to ask Stefan to talk about the Alexa camera a little bit. Stefan. Good morning. Yeah. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Jay-Z. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for having us. So um, for some of you not as familiar uh, with ARI, uh, just a quick summary. The company was founded in 1917 by two film enthusiasts in Munich, Germany. So we've been building film cameras uh, uh, or general motion, professional motion picture equipment, so camera lighting, lenses. Uh, we have also uh, camera stabilizing equipment in our portfolio now. And it's a uh, very good timing uh, because uh, we are actually celebrating the 10 year anniversary of Alexa. Uh, we uh, announced the camera in 2009 at IPC in Amsterdam and we started shipping in June of 2010. And there were various uh, iterations of this uh, camera throughout. So we started with the classic, then we had a plus with basically had all the lens control functionality built in. Then we introduced a, a studio camera, which actually had an optical uh, spinning reflex shutter uh, and an optical viewfinder. Uh, the advantage there was that it was uh, actually uh, no, no delay uh, on, uh, on, on the viewfinder. Uh, you could judge focus better um, and you had less viewing boutique. Um, since then, we also introduced the uh, mini camera, which you see in this particular setup. It's small, lightweight, very flexible system and widely adopted in the features and television work. Um, we also built a, a large format Alexa, it's Alexa 65, where we essentially stitched three sensors, Super 35 sensors together. And that is exclusively available through Airy Rental, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Airy. And uh, the setup you saw in the volume there at Lux Machina on this virtual production stage, we used the Alexa LF, and LF stands for large format, so there are essentially two sensors um, uh, stitched together. So it's a 36 by 24 frame approximately, so like a DSLR frame. Uh, it's a 4K natively. And, uh, you know, the reason why we were able to, to maintain is the fact that, the, you know, Alexa is the industry standard over this decade was that we uh, actually focused not just on the uh, resolution, uh, you know, the case or the, the pixels. Uh, that is certainly one aspect of the overall image quality, but maybe not the most important one. We also focused on uh, flexible workflows, ease of use, and uh, more importantly, dynamic range. Um, so it's, uh, again, essentially the same basic or core sensor technology, which we utilize now over 10 years, and we still have uh, uh, arguably the, one of the, the best uh, or the best uh, overall image quality. Um, we do see an increased interest and in accelerated adaptation of this virtual production stages. Uh, and we're fortunate that our uh, Alexa LF and LF minis now uh, are utilized on Mandalorian since season one. Um, Greg Frazier did some initial testing with, uh, with other camera manufacturers and came to the conclusion that uh, our sensor is the most suitable one. Um, he referred it to the larger pixels, but I think it has to do with the uh, optical low pass filter we're utilizing. So uh, in, in, in layman's terms, basically not to have any, any matrix pattern or fixed patterns, uh, we put basically a slight diffusion in front of the sensor. And in our case, it's actually a multi-layer crystal uh, which just gives a, a wonderful rendering of uh, skin tones and a great balance between resolution and a filmic kind of uh, uh, feel. So uh, that's it uh, from my side. If there are any questions, I would ask you to ask them now, please, because uh, unfortunately I have to excuse myself in a couple of minutes to uh, 
go to another presentation. Thank you, Stefan. Yes, Stefan is uh, with us till 1130. So um, yes, uh, you talked about the 6K camera you have, the 4K and the three and a half K. So for, for our project, we used uh, the, the 4K and the three and a half K cameras and uh, 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 it integrated nicely in our project. Um, uh, Verena, do we have already questions at the moment since Stefan is special? <laughs> you have, to, you have simply too many customers out there, Stefan. Not yet. That's, that's a good question. Not yet. I mean, the, the, um, also we keep on we keep on talking about this project, so we want to also give the audience time to think about it and uh, ask the questions. So the next part, when I come back uh, uh, to play the video, then um, Zeiss, our other German product partner, actually supported us with the lenses. So it turns out that Snehal, our speaker, is an active protester out there. We know that we are very busy in the US at the moment, so he asked me to speak on his um, uh, behalf. Um, so what the size men's lens metadata is doing uh, or is helping us, it goes right from the lens into the camera raw data, is then available for the VFX vendor. So our Nuke operator, our, our compositor, who, who combines background and foreground, uses the metadata to distort uh, 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 the image. So here we see the size lens connected with the Sony camera. As I said, we use two ARRI cameras, but we also use the Sony and the RED and the Canon cameras, the, the, the Panavision camera. So the, the background plate lens metadata, the insert lens metadata, goes with the raw camera footage uh, into the new compositing tool where the distortion then can be done. So when we have straight parallel lines, the composition works much better when we take the optical um, uh, 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 transforms out. Uh, uh, this gets done all the time and normally we uh, shoot a checkerboard uh, style lens grid test. Uh, uh, so uh, 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 to help the VFX vendor to see where the distortion is. Now that it's all digital and we no, don't need this additional footage, it's a lot of work to do this for every lens. So um, a VFX vendor and the camera team uh, appreciates to do this modern workflow. So there we see Heidi actually talking uh, uh, using Zoom. Back in the day, we didn't call it Zoom. We, we Skyped, I guess. <laughs> so in the movie, we called it Skype. Today, we would call it Zooming. So she Skypes with her friends in Germany. This was the background plate. The, the straight lines of the laptop are actually a very good reference. So the, 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 the footage was normalized, was composed, and um, it saved a lot of time and created efficiency. So that's the shot, um, how it came out in the movie. So now our next uh, presenter is Patrick from Pomford, I think live from Munich. So here you see the Pomford onset color correction tool. Patrick, what can you tell us about Pomford? Hello everybody. <clears throat> thanks Jay-Z for the introduction and thanks for having us. Uh, we have been involved in the project with our product LiveGrade. Um, we are doing as a quick overview, we're doing onset uh, software products for 10 years now, more or less since digital cinematography is a thing, which we heard is 10 years ago, the Alexa came out shortly after the red camera. So um, we're supporting the, the camera department with software and there are two topics in particular. One is data management, so getting footage off the camera cards as soon as possible. And the other one that we're seeing here <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, color correction. So LiveGrade is a system that allows to color correct the live signals of the camera and see the live signal on a monitor directly on set uh, with the simulated color grade uh, like you would do then in the final grading. And this has actually two reasons. One of the reasons is simply preview. So it aids the, the DP's work on set. So if you understand the creative work of the DP of setting the scene, choosing camera light settings, uh, the lens and the, the, the actual what you see in the, in the picture. 
And so we feel that more and more the digital look becomes a part of that because it can influence back how the lighting is set. Do you want to light up the darks a little bit or is the contrast too high through a certain digital look? So the digital look as it is part of the, um, of the, of the overall look of a movie plays an important role. So preview is one thing and the system allows to live color correct. So you have tiny color wheels on set on these DIT cards that we had here um, and can adjust from scene to scene from different lightings. For example, you have outside light coming here. So the light might change a little bit over time. And to maintain consistency, you can uh, adjust the, the grading there. And th the second thing is um, that you want to uh, to get that that look that you gathered on set that really set the DP like this is the image that I want to I want to see. You can try to get that metadata through to um, to post production. So one thing was getting it into dailies so that the dailies look exactly as the as the monitor on set would look like. So that was one. That was then the, ad, the added benefit. So the extra time spent on adjustments of the digital look on set interactively carries on then to quicker dailies, uh, color corrected dailies. And then sometimes even further down depends on the production uh, to final color grading. So that's a, a system that's hardware, software combined, um, scales very well to a ton of cameras, really depending on the size of the project. And in that, in that project, Jay-Z mentioned that we, try to use the as many fancy technologies that that we could our get our hands on and one of them uh, one of that was aces it's not the newest one but uh, but one of the technologies that that bring together vendors and and builds interchange and interoperability between systems and in that case it built our color pipeline so really from camera signal uh, the high dynamic range signal that's encoded in, in the SDI signals on set, how that is uh, get into a common color space, the ACES color space, how then the actual color grading is done on that and how then the transforms get us to the, to the monitor. And as this is a, is a workflow that's, that's then reproduced on every system that was in that project, we had a very good pipeline that in, act, in fact then could reproduce the image on all, on all workstations. And also more than uh, more than systems in these days, uh, uh, the, one of the requirements is that technology needs to fly under the radar so that we don't interfere with the creative part on set. So the the behind the scenes footage of live grade are pretty short. I realize when I look to the footage because it's always uh, used in a dark environment. The monitor is the important part and the operator, the digital imaging technician or the colorist who operates it actually moves his trackballs uh, as if one would play a piano without looking at it because you just look at the image. So um, the behind the scenes footage did show that <clears throat> actually every calibrated monitor in our environment in all different rooms got fed by the Pomford life grade system there. And uh, 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 you saw that the the, the, the area where the actors are acting, where, where, where the action happens is separate from the technology area. Um, often we have a digital imaging technician tent or here we had separate rooms. This is why I did show camera pens to show one or the other. But um, I think the Pomfort tool, it's also the business model is very interesting. You rent it per month, uh, I guess. So it's, um, it's very easy for a DIT to have it available at no time and instantly, but don't have to buy a lot of hardware to run it, right? It's an interesting business model. Yeah. Yes, one, because you mentioned the darkness, one of the important features in the early days of LifeGrade was dimming the user interface even further down than what the monitor could be dark of the computer. So dimming everything and getting it dark in the studio was one of the important things to really get out of the way and not add extra light to the scene. Very good. So sharing. So let's go. Thank you, Patrick. Please remember, uh, 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 send the questions to the chat so that we, we can have questions uh, in the Q&A phase. So next I want to talk about lighting on set. So this is now the scenery of our virtual production stage in Palm Springs. Actually in front of the stage, there were 600 people in the room. 
and there we see the freestyle mini from KinoFlow. So this virtual production stage had the imagery to complement um, uh, uh, the scenery, but it was also supported by the LED lighting in the background. While we had many different lights available from different manufacturers, because the rental house is actually giving the light, not the light manufacturer, the KinoFlow lighting was actually connected to the computer, playing back the background, rendering the 3D elements. Um, when the, this Alexa Mini actually went up, we could see through the window the, the bottom, the ground next to the train. When the dolly moved down and looked up, we could see the sky. Uh, 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 so there's uh, wireless transmitters, GPS information on the antennas there. And then the, the Kino flow lighting was programmed into this whole uh, uh, system there. There I want to introduce Frieda to uh, talk about Kino flow. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this event. Uh, uh, much appreciated. Uh, just for those who don't know uh, about Kino flow, we started back in 1987. We were the first uh, color correct fluorescent uh, location lighting system uh, that rendered proper skin tones. And this was all harmonized to the film stocks. Uh, Robbie Mueller was, uh, Robbie Mullon was one of the first uh, to work with our uh, lights. We did a movie called Barfly together. Um, and just last, I guess this week, I just got a, a notice that uh, the vendors gave us a shout out recently at one of his academy chats, where he said that uh, Kino Flow was, in for was formative in the look of his films. And of course, him working with Robbie, and Robbie worked a lot with our lights. So now we've transitioned from the fluorescent world into the LED world, and with that come numerous challenges. Uh, essentially, uh, we're dealing with uh, LEDs that now have to harmonize with the, the spectral response of cameras. And in this particular uh, incidence where we're dealing with LED uh, imagery or images in the background, these are generated through RGB, three, three wavelengths of uh, red, green, and blue. So if you try to use the light emanating from that screen to illuminate your subject, you're not necessarily going to get a full spectrum um, Calvin. And that creates uh, issues with uh, skin tone quality. So in this case, what we're trying to do is we are synchronizing uh, our lights to the background. So as lighting in the background changes, the lights can be synchronized with the camera to reflect that change in light. So if if we suddenly go into a tunnel, the light obviously you know, dims down and goes off. If there's a street lamp that comes by that's very orange, the light will change that orange color and, and render it in real time uh, as, uh, as that would look. So these are all sort of uh, challenges that uh, are, are, are coming on board. What it also means is that the traditional means of controlling lights, which is from a dimmer board, is also being uh, challenged because now all this technologies all, all being synchronized through uh, uh, media servers, through gaming engines. And for them all to work together, it now also requires a whole new way of controlling light. So these are all things that uh, we're working on. Um, we're able to also harmonize our spectral response or the, the spectral output of our lamps to give you a decent skin tone color on particular cameras because cameras very similar to film stock in the past they all had different slightly different spectral responses to light in this case we can actually harmonize to uh, a number of cameras so exciting technology and it's one that we're looking forward to uh, providing lighting solutions microphone jay-z your microphone Thank you, Frida. I, I didn't want to scare you by switching the camera on. <laughs> I didn't warn you. I should have given you the warning light. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for this. That's actually a, a, a new aspect uh, which started perhaps two years ago that we now need the metadata of the lighting as well. Or don't need it, but can, you, uh, can make use of it and have yet another creative tool in our uh, uh, tool chest there. Yeah. Thank you for this. So, um, for everybody, we, um, we collect all the questions for the Q&A for the end of the presentations. And now to the system administrator. Yes, there's the 
the next screen sharing element. And I'm not sure if I share the right screen. I try it again. That one, share. So um, uh, 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 part of uh, having the right color and the right lighting on set is that we play nice together with the next step. Uh, uh, in the process. So now coming to film finishing, what we did at the end of the day of our technology presentation, we used the base light color corrector. Um, uh, uh, that's a little wire diagram here. Again, we had um, Soho Net um, providing our fast network connection. Uh, Verena's part was to demonstrate how a slow data connection works. Yeah, so we needed for color correction a fast data connection. Uh, uh, we had the the data being captured in the morning in Palm Springs. High resolution 8K data went in no time via Soho Net to the uh, Baselight office where our colorist um, uh, uh, Andrea did color correct live on the original camera footage. And then we sent a visually lossless compressed signal in high resolution back to Palm Springs. In Palm Springs, we had a director and a DP sitting with us. Still, we had two powerful laser projectors, which did show uh, 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 the color accurate image coming live from uh, uh, Hollywood from a uh, base light and we could via phone connection. I think we used blue jeans, another uh, uh, interactive multimedia collaboration tool to talk to each other. And um, this is also a function we use very heavily in these days. Also before um, uh, uh, I, I, I worked on projects where the colorist sits in Hollywood, the director sits in Burbank and the DP is already on the next movie in London or in Australia. So we often do three way uh, high resolution, high uh, quality color correction demonstration just to get the job done and have the creatives making the decisions so that we have a continuous look from beginning to the end. So there I want to introduce Sebastian now um, to talk about uh, Baselight. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Jay-Z. And um, yeah, um, I work for Filmlight uh, as a director of sales here in America. Um, just a little bit of background to, to Filmlight. Um, so we were founded in 2002 um, with the core business uh, on the innovation, implementation and support of our products in leading production companies. Um, post-production facilities and film and TV studios around the world and uh, today our technology is still recognized as I think the best in class and we have extended our reach with products such as Baselight which um, is one of our um, major products um, that uh, is a very powerful grading software um, that really creates fantastic looking images. Uh, we also have Daylight uh, which takes our grading know-how uh, on set and providing um, a very powerful dailies platform. And we also have uh, plugins for Avid, um, for Nuke and for Flame, um, the leading editing and VFX platforms, which together then form this seamless color pipeline. So uh, we like to know <laughs> and speak about it uh, between production and finishing. So um, our products are not islands. Uh, they work together as a file based level and with the other products in post-production workflows. Um, our headquarter is actually in London. That's where our research, uh, design and manufacturing operations are centered. And we have a couple of local offices around the world. Um, the second biggest one, obviously here in Hollywood. And uh, then the third biggest one is actually in Munich in Germany. So um, we have also smaller offices in, in Tokyo, Beijing, Singapore and Mumbai. But uh, interestingly, we have four people who are Germans. Uh, one of our directors is actually German. We have two German product specialists and uh, one of our image engineers and myself. So um, yeah, we are continuously developing new products, um, especially for the new technology. 4K HDR is of course a big topic. Um, a lot of automation using uh, our new APR and uh, we are very well known for a very intelligent color management. So um, especially if you have, you know, all these different cameras, 
Um, we have a very, very nice uh, color management called True Light, which is in all our products. Um, and um, it's basically transforming the color space from the camera into a working color space, which can be ACES, but can also be Film Light, T Log, E Gamut, and others uh, that you can select from. And then you can choose a, a display rendering transform to get to Rec 709 or Rec 2020. Um, so most of it is really automatic. That's really fantastic. All our tools are being reprogrammed at the moment into uh, being color space aware, as we call it. So um, that's a very, very important part. But um, then, of course, remote grading. Uh, and remote grading became so important. And uh, as Jay-Z said, <laughs> Corona accelerated that, um, actually. So it's very important to us. Um, and yeah, well, in Palm Springs at the HPA this year, um, Jay-Z and his team demonstrated that very impressively, I think. Um, so yeah, we were one part of this for the final grade. Um, we did the remote grading in Los Angeles, where Andrea Klebach, uh, one of the colorists at eFilm, graded the image, which uh, then by SohoNet and Clearview and Pixpan got transported to Palm Springs, uh, where the audience could see the live grading. And uh, we actually help our customers at the moment as well with products that are specifically designed for grading from home, uh, which is, um, of course, very important. Yeah, and, and uh, Sebastian, what's the color of my windsurf board behind me? Oh, well, hang on. Um, it looks like yellow to me. Good, good. Just testing yeah. <laughs> if you're telling the truth here. Yeah? Yes, you know about the color. RGB values, though. <laughs> good, good. No, it's yellow. Thank you. Thank you. That's confirming that you are good people. And uh, Wolfgang Lempert, your director from Germany, is actually the founder of uh, one of the founders of Filmlight, right? Exactly, yes. Uh, 2002, yeah. Filmlight got founded, and uh, Wolfgang was one part, uh, one of the first products was actually the North Light, which was like uh, the first film scanner. And from there actually base light evolved. Uh, yeah, so there I, I uh, ho hopefully you bring him to one of our GABA film meetings. Um, we want to see this first event as a trigger for more sessions to come after. So um, that's our uh, 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 meeting to 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 all uh, learn to know each other and and recognize each other in the future. So uh, uh, the main motivation is to do more of those and also help each other and meet each other. So <clears throat> thank you, Sebastian. Absolutely, you're welcome. So now next, uh, our German-speaking editor, Barry, um, did all his editing on the Avid in the cloud. Um, I want to hand the presentation over to Barry. <clears throat> and you plan to share your screen now, Barry, I think. Yeah, that, that's right. So um, I'm just going to switch over to the uh, Avid instance that I, I used um, to make this all happen. So you may not hear the sound. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to Jay-Z for inviting me to be part of this project. It's been really a, a thrilling ride since the very beginning. And, uh, and I, thank you for making me an honorary German. I, I lived in uh, Munich for six years, and I speak a bit of German. Um, but this is really a demonstration of, of the actual timeline that I used to make the uh, public cut. And, and uh, as you can see, I'm just dragging across this. And, and what we have here, if you see in the upper left, the, the Teradici PCIOP client, it's a, a small software program that gets installed on my ancient MacBook Pro here. And as you can see, it's extremely zippy. There's just very, very low latency. And if I push play on the, the interface, the it starts and it stops. And, and it was really a revelation to me as an editor that I could have everything in the cloud that uh, the media stored in the cloud and the Avid workstation, the, the Windows version of the Avid is in the cloud as well. And, and Barry, um, uh, I just want to uh, repeat here, when you say it works very zippy, that's a positive term for being fast, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Schnell. <laughs> Sehr Schnell, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very interactive and very low latency. So I didn't feel like, it didn't feel like I was working in the cloud because of the, the technology that Avid's put together with uh, Microsoft Azure. 
and it's just extremely fast um, working that way. And, and also, you know, transferring data from one cloud to another is extremely fast since we're all in the cloud as well. So you can see down here on this lower layer, all, the, all of the, the sound effects and the music were all trans, uh, uploaded from my local computer up into the cloud and then transferred into the Azure. And then I don't know if uh, Jay-Z is going to, to talk about this later, but um, this is the, uh, the scene in the, the clubhouse where we actually needed to get this uh, shot. Are you going to speak about that, do you think? No, you, we, you can right dive right into it. Or I, 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 I give the introduction. Since we, since we are now in the cloud, we don't only deliver dailies very fast, nearly instantly. We can also in the morning deliver a cut uh, to the director and to the DP. So we went to the second location and looked at the cut and saw that the connecting shot was missing. So somebody had a piece of green screen in the trunk of the car. So it's just two people in the background holding up the green screen behind Heidi and we could instantly reshoot this reaction which was missing. Yeah. Yeah, and that was definitely a, another benefit of the cloud workflow is that, you know, here we are in the bar and uh, they pu literally pull up the green screen. And so, so this shot would have been forgotten and in a normal production workflow, we would have found out only a week later, perhaps, and... Uh, the, the dirndl might be in the laundry by then or the actor <laughs> might be on the next movie already. So there, um, this efficiency of having this instant workflow in the cloud really helped us to save this cut. Yeah. Yeah. So the, just as Jay-Z was saying, um, you know, that's, that's definitely the, the instant upload of the dailies to the cloud and then being able to review your shots and your timeline. And so, you know, this is the scene uh, and then this is the visual effect that Jay-Z was talking about with the, the monitor composite. And then this reaction shot is that's the temporary comp that I, I created just to get, uh, you know, convey to the team, to the director and, and uh, the other creatives, what it would look like once I got the final composite back from, from Blackmagic. So in terms of what my part was you know it was very easy to work with the creative teams and and as a creative editor work with the footage and, and I was blessed to have very good looking high quality footage on the project because Jay Z just assembled the best of the best and and I'm very happy to just to be you know a small part in and bringing this project to life. Talking about the technology in use now, you use a 2010 MacBook Pro which now has a value of uh, $299. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, that... The amazing thing is that, that you just use the interface, actually, the monitor, the keyboard, and the mouse, and then there's a super high computer in the cloud somewhere. You see at the top of the screen, it reads Teradici PC over IP. So this amazing, up-to-date, most expensive computer is available to you for uh, on an hourly pay base. The storage is the other most amazing storage, which allows you to transfer terabytes in seconds. And uh, uh, so all this is like amazingly fast and high quality. And your equipment at home is actually just there to provide a screen, a keyboard and a mouse, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, it's um, that, that's really the beauty of this, this the, the conception that, that Avid's put together with Teradici is that it just essentially works just like um, KVM I would have in the office that I just log into the cloud and, and make the, the movie. Yeah, in the cloud, what we learned actually is that there are many different clouds out there. Yes. Uh, I like your term of doing cloud hopping. So you also need a data manager still because the data in the cloud needs to be in the right cloud. So we are at the moment at the Microsoft Azure cloud, which has a special uh, joint venture going on with Avid. And uh, if I look at the, at the Hollywood blockbuster movies I worked on in the last five years, I think 99% are cut on an Avid. 
So um, uh, to, to, to have this workflow going with the Avid is really powerful and very current. Yeah, yeah it actually was, was very uh, timely, as you were saying in the introduction, because I'm, my, my next door laptop that I'm, I'm using to do visual effects on right now is, is connected to my facility. But the, the, the idea that I could work from home and, and successfully create projects was really born out of this project and, and gave me the confidence to you know, be able to quickly transition to the, the COVID uh, environment that we're in now. Very good. And again, everybody, punch your questions into the Q&A. So Barry is available for Q&A after. And uh, now I want to uh, talk about if you, Barry, show us again, and you did. Now our camera operator, so Chris, actually, uh, we found Chris in the audience. He didn't even know that he will be our camera operator. Um, uh, so the audience of the HPA, the Hollywood Professional Association, is everybody from production through VFX into post-production and then broadcasters, Netflix, Amazon, also the BBC and the ARD and the Hessische Rundfunk. So everybody is there. And uh, we had more cameras than operators. And I spotted Chris in the audience and he volunteered. Uh, uh, of course, I met him before doing camera work. He volunteered to just pick up a camera and uh, operate it for some of the shots for us. So Chris, how did it feel to you for being hitchhiked? Uh. <laughs> Uh, it felt pretty good. Um, it, it was amazing to see actually how uh, fast this workflow is. It was incredible to see that whatever I filmed, I didn't even have to worry about the data that we created in this camera. Um, it, you can still work just as a regular uh, cam op, work with your uh, first and second AC, you just give them uh, the data, they pass it along. And all of a sudden it's in the cloud, it's being edited. And only if, I think it was 15 minutes later, we saw the whole cut together. So it was very impressive. Yeah, and, and also um, it, it, it turns out that we get a very good quality with all of these cameras in these days, while there's of course uh, differences in the detail but um, uh, they all use the same language in terms of menu setting. We, we have the ISO and uh, the Kelvin color temperature, the shutter speed, the frame rate. So uh, 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 all of these cameras we had on set, you had your hands on before, I guess, yeah? No, this was actually the first time I ever used that camera. <laughs> so I, I didn't know where any of these buttons were, but uh, like you said, I mean, you know, every camera has the basic, I mean, you know, most of the settings are very, very basic. And uh, so it, it was easy to operate the, uh, the camera. Um, and which thanks one, to- which, which one did we give to you then? Which model? It was the Blackmagic Orsa Mini Pro. I don't know if it was a 4K or 4.6K. As Like, I don't know which version it was, but um, yeah, I mean, with the Asus workflow, I feel like it doesn't really, you know, matter which camera you use. It could have been an iPhone. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah. ASUS, uh, I want to explain ASUS. Uh, uh, it's the Academy Color Encoding System. So the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Science decided to help the filmmakers out there to have a common color procedure in the common color formula. So two years ago, I became the vice chair of the Academy Color Project. I think just because if you put on a fake German accent, you sound more technical and trustworthy. So it's a very good trick I can recommend for everybody. And uh, 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 so I, I, I work since two years now on this project and I, I, I take pleasure in it to listen to people uh, 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 pointing out that it is a useful tool, even that they don't know that I work with the, the team out there. So, so that's good to know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like I have to even say that on, on the uh, small, pro much smaller projects, obviously, that I work on uh, compared to all these big Hollywood productions, um, it's already a great tool. I mean, working in Asus, uh, doing small music videos or even like commercials where you have multiple cameras, um, make uh, it really makes the life e uh, so much easier in, in post. And um, obviously, I mean, the, the producers are happy too because you save them money. 
And I think that's um, that's a big thing nowadays is, is helping people to save money um, and then maybe even reallocate uh, that money um, and put it into somewhere where it might be even worth uh, putting more money into. So I think that's a really great tool. Very good. So now I want to thank you, Chris. Now I want to show a couple of scenes of our movie and talk to our actors who were in the movie. Um, to do so, the system administrator, I think, needs to give me the power again to share my screen. Yes. This one and that one. I'm not sure if this is the right one. And I click it again. See, this is the commercial break where everybody can breathe and relax and put their questions into the chat window. System administrator, I wouldn't need it again because I think I picked the wrong window. So I have to talk to my earpiece like a professional system administrator. Please give me the, yes, that one. So uh, first I want to show you this shot. And uh, so there we see Jennifer. Uh, 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 Jennifer, actually, we met her at an, at an industry function. And uh, uh, when I heard uh, that uh, Jennifer has a German accent, I asked her, do you have a Diendl? What is like a stupid question, kind of. It's a cliche question. But she answered yes. And so she became our actress to serve the beer. Uh, 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 so Jennifer, uh, uh, was this one of your first projects in Hollywood? Hi, thank you, Jay-Z. Um, yeah, so I moved last year from Germany to Los Angeles to like, built my career as an actress. And when I met Jay-Z, I was still in acting school. And so this was one of the first projects I had in LA as an actress. I was pretty excited about that. And yeah, so to come to the set and wear my Diendl from Germany and talk German the whole day, it was pretty cool. So um, yeah, I was, I was just happy to get this opportunity to be uh, a part of the project. And I had this feeling in Germany that you have to take your dinner with you. I don't know what it was, but I just, I just had this feeling and this was the first opportunity to wear it for a job. And yeah, actually I have two other jobs with my dinner too in the next week. So that was a pretty good feeling I had there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, that's good. Yeah. And you became a pilot as well. I think we had you later in the scene as well at the terminal one walking in the background as a pilot so you had yeah two but without the dindle though with a normal outfit <laughs> yeah was a was an international operating pilot not a german pilot yes, yes. exactly <laughs> so then we we also have barbara on the call i want to uh, give a shout out to barbara who played heidi in our movie barbara wilder can you hear us yes i can hear you hi so you were actually on all four sets already. And uh, here is the virtual production stage. We are not in Germany, of course. We are in this virtual production stage. How did it feel to you to be on, on such a stage? Was it the first time for you being on a virtual production stage? Yeah, it was. It was um, I mean, in, uh, yeah, it was one of the first times, yes. Um, I mean, it was pretty exciting, you know. Um, I don't know exactly what, what else I can help you with. I'm not like really, yeah. I, I, I can ask you the questions and Chris has a question as well. I would, I would have a great question for you. I think um, what, what is really interesting for me to know is how immersive is that space as a, for an actor? Um, you know, instead of being in front of a green screen, being immersed in a world like that. Um. I don't know exactly what you mean with that. Like, do you mean? Um... Oh, I, I, okay. So, for example, I think it was the Orient Express where they uh, were using also uh, LED walls instead of green okay. screen. So, they were saying that the actors felt so much more immersed sitting in the train, thinking that they're actually moving, and that some of them really got some sort of emotion sickness um, <laughs> versus just you know sitting next to a green screen. So. You know, that, right. does it, is it sort of believable? Uh, does it, you know, uh, does it yeah. create a sort of a believable world? Yeah, it absolutely does that. Yeah, it absolutely creates a believable world. And, and of course, it's easier to, um, you know, um, 
uh, act in an environment like that where everything feels very real, then, um, you know, not. Yeah, actually, I, 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 I think I can hear what Barbara is saying because we did actually uh, shoot a huge green screen scene with Barbara. Then we had a little green screen scene in, uh, in Jameson's. And then we were on the two different virtual production stages. And Barbara did act the same professional in every environment, actually, thinking about it now. Barbara has actually an, an actor's face and a normal Barbara face. So it, she is Heidi as soon as we say action and then turns into Barbara again. So there it might be that Barbara thinks, what do you mean? Because she did the same great job in every environment now thinking about it. But then also um, we didn't do the whole movie. We were actually only for one and a half hours on the virtual production stage where we had the four wall building. And then in Palm Springs, uh, it was also two times one hour only. Yeah, so perhaps the, the whole feeling for virtual production didn't really come up, yeah. Good, and then there is uh, Festmeister Hans, John Baumgartner. Uh, 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 I, I met you, um, uh, John, at a couple of other events here, your red head, we see you with your red head. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. You, you didn't recognize me? Well, let me just help out there just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Also, los geht's. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, for you, um, you are an entertainer in many areas. Uh, mm -hmm. You do Oktoberfest shows, but you also, you are an editor, producer, director, and actor. So yeah. you are in, in all these areas of our filmmaking uh, business. Yeah. So to, to, to you, the virtual production stage, what do you think about it? It was the product, the virtual production stage was really amazing. Um, the entire production itself felt to me like a project that I've taken uh, part in numerous times called the uh, 48 hour film festival. I don't know if anybody has ever uh, taken part of that. It's basically the concept is, uh, you're given, I think, a, um, a prop and a, uh, a line or something, and then a, and then a genre of uh, film or television. And then you have 20 or 48 hours with a group of friends to create a five to 10 minute movie that they all screen on the uh, on Sunday. So everybody gets their uh, gets their job that they have to do on Friday, and then everybody shoots it on Sunday, or everybody shoots it during the week, staying up all night and doing this. The technology that we were working with on this pr uh, production, and especially because we could work with the cloud and be able to have s shots actually being edited and color corrected while we are live on set working on things, meant that there was this completely seamless flow. I mean, it's you see the technology coming together. Of course, there's still hiccups and 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 whatnot as we're as we're working on it. But as it all starts to come together, you can really see how as the technology is continuing to move in this direction, this is going to be a completely seamless work workflow. So that was really exciting in and of itself to be working in that environment. Um, specifically on the Lux Machina stage, what I thought was interesting. So you know, we got in there. You can see on the on the video that we're watching with the Lux Machina background. You know, there's like a forest there. There's um, you know multiple panels. We've got two side panels, a back panel, and even a ceiling panel. That means that any reflections that you're getting off of any glassware or anything that you have is going to look like a forest. And uh, you know, you dim the lights in the rest of the room, and it works really well. Um, so I, just, I thought this was kind of a two-dimensional type image that we were working with, uh, with the LED screen and Lux Machina. What I didn't realize until the camera actually moved was that the trees that are in the background are created in a 3D virtual environment. That means that the camera has a, some type of signaling system on it that tells the computer where in this reality of the, of the 3D room the camera is actually located. So as the camera moves, the the background counters, just like how if you were, I don't know, driving driving in your car when you were a little kid and you said, mommy, the, the moon is following us. Well, that's because the moon, moon is so far away. So if you had a mountain in the deep background on this, the mountain would stay put as you would move back and forth, the trees would counter in a parallax. Fa uh, parallax. So mm -hmm. it was really interesting, a little bit, a little bit disconcerting to be an actor in that environment when it's shifting because that's not my point of view, that's the camera's point of view. But when you realize that in the final production that the camera, it's, it's, it's seamless. The camera feels like 
it is in that room and you can actually counter and move and the background moves moves back and forth uh, to create the environment simultaneously. It was a really amazing piece of technology to be able to see, to see and I can only imagine that it's going to get better as we as we move along. Good, yeah. So, thank you, John. Do we have Marius on the call by now as well? I think he was traveling. I I don't see Marius. So Marius was our 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 other German speaker, and you saw in in my video the last group picture we shot. I I enjoy it so much to look at group pictures because we didn't take a group picture for three months now since we did social distance ourselves. Uh, uh, but um, I have the feeling that the acting and the actors did adapt easy to the virtual production stage and it didn't feel different. So now it becomes a helpful tool. We might go back to normal. I think as soon as we are back to normal, we still remember the um, uh, technically advanced tools which we now just have to use here and today and perhaps stick to it or perhaps go to normal. But um, what we need to do is evaluate all these different um, uh, technologies and test it. So Verena, do we have pressing questions from the audience? Yes, we do. So first of all, do you hear me okay again? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, perfect. So I'm happy that I'm the bad example for bad internet connection and not one of our contributors. <laughs> Spectrum had had a lot of issues the last week, so I guess it cannot handle this awesomeness of a webinar. Um, so uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, Katharina Baron, hi Katharina, by the way, good to, good to have you here. Um, she asked, coast-wise, how expensive is it to shoot with this technology versus to shoot outdoors? Um, and it looks like you need to shoot the backgrounds anyways. How would this apply if you want to have a movie set in New York, but you shoot in a studio, or where do you see the main application of this? Yeah, so the uh, Unreal Engine Epic Games has a huge library already of 3D elements. So you have an existing library, you can see it like stock footage, but uh, what you, uh, um, the costs actually, you would send a low budget crew to shoot the elements and don't have to send your million dollar actors uh, there. And then you can send a lower budget crew around the world and bring different locations to your high budget actors rather than sending them around the world. So the second set with the train, um, Sam Nicholson with Stargate, they traveled for two months through Germany and had two 8K cameras uh, with suck mounts on the windows uh, of a train and just filmed Germany for two months. It's an 8K image, which is huge, and they use only the 4K image. But since the camera pans, then they, they can pan through the whole 8K image. So it, it was based on um, collecting all data with other teams and bring it to the one location. So the virtual production stage, we don't know how much it would cost, but it could be like up to $15,000 per day that you book such a room. So this was a number which was thrown at us by somebody. Uh, uh, it's an early market price. We don't know how expensive it really will be. And then you do package pricing anyway, depending how long you use it. We just used it for one and a half hour. And uh, yeah. So it's- yes, the yeah. Does the 15,000 include just the location and the, the wall itself, but, or does it include the operators who would operate the whole LED wall? I, I, I think it doesn't, yeah, it, I think it includes the operators who operate the LED wall. It doesn't necessarily include if you need additional backgrounds and you bring your own camera operator in as well. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Also, Nancy was asking what library uh, you're talking about. I think Turbo Squid, CG Trader, and Quixel are good places to start out with. Actually, um, uh, Epic Games, they have games in their name. So there is a lot of libraries already for the gaming industry, and they look more and more real. So um, yes, they are different uh, libraries. They are third-party libraries. It doesn't have to come from Epic Games. There's also 
uh, Unity, which is another system. So the, the gaming industry helps a lot to support this technology. Uh, and Unreal Sam Engine. Nicholson from, oh. Sam Nicholson from Stargate says he's got a few thousand locations uh, in his catalog as well. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, Unreal Engine is free, so everybody nowadays can uh, build their own uh, sets. And, you know, I mean, there's no, no, no more excuses. And the software works on old laptops, too. Hmm. Any awesome. more? Um, Katarina, yeah, Katarina, I unmuted you if you have a follow up question. Yeah, I or have like everything. a quick follow up question to that. If you're talking about libraries and about low budget crews, then as a filmmaker, I'm immediately thinking, well, will that have the look and feel that you want to have for uh, the film that you want to create? Because, you know, a lot of the times you choose the location as a character, right? So um, how are the restrictions in visual filmmaking if you want to create your own look? Yeah, so um, the, the system we had with the four big video walls at um, Lux Machina actually came with a color corrector. So you had the Unreal Engine playback, devi playback device, but they also had a Resolve color corrector. We, uh, uh, so you could uh, change uh, day for night. You could change a whole library from a daylight library into a night library using color correction. Um, also, you adapt the lighting on your actor to the color temperature of the background, or you change the color temperature of the background to the lighting and the foreground. So there's a color corrector um, built in into the system. But since you said low budget, a uh, lower budget would be the train set. This would be the second location where we are on, where we had three monitors behind the windows. We were in a room and could then transform this room either into a train or he has New York as well and has other locations. So you can have your room looking out of the window in different locations. But um, since this technology is new um, and we cannot build enough systems fast enough, it will not be available to low budget productions right now. It no, no, that was a misunderstanding. Yeah. You said that you would send the lower budget crew ah. to film the outdoors. I was not okay. referring to this being yeah. a low budget production. Yeah. I was just saying if you are having a high budget production and then you go out and you shoot the outdoors with a lower budget crew, is yeah. that not like compromising your high production value and, and like, you know, the look and feel uh -huh. that create that's my question i see so mainly i i had a thought of the lower budget um team is they don't have the million dollar uh, george clooney with them and tom cruise with them they can travel without them and have the height paid talent uh, uh, waiting in a secure environment so um it's still a uh, uh, professional camera operators and and digital imaging technicians which go out there the budget turns lower because you don't have to move the extensive expensive talent around the world oh but, yeah okay so it was revolving to the talent okay thanks yeah yeah, yeah. so thank you katarina um, so our next question was from Nancy Riley, and I'm going to un unmute you in a second too. Um, so the first, she had two questions. The first question was, um, I guess it's concerning mostly the DP, but I know that Patrick already started to answer it in the chat, but I want it to, you know, everybody to, to have the answer. Uh, she uh, commented, so you're saying instead of the DP sitting with uh, the color time in post, they would use a designate what they want and just send the metadata to the post-production people. Um, Patrick, do you want to start um, commenting on it because you already did in the chat and then whoever as a DP wants to join in, they can join. Yeah, and so, obviously Tracy, you too. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Verena. Um, your audio broke up a little bit. So I, I, because I read the, also the question, the question was, um, does that move parts of the color timing closer to the set? And I would say definitely if, if it's possible to, to include the digital look or the, the work 
on the digital look already on the work on set because it becomes a natural part of setting lights and choosing lenses and also adjusting the digital look to the to the scene and to the actors and to the to the um, to, to the scene um, then you have already a very good starting point for the look so i would say at least for the dailies uh, color correction this can move a lot of the work already on set and can then be faster for the dailies creation and the for the final grading and sebastian will know more about this i would i would guess that colorists if they really then need to hold the whole story together they might go beyond that and and start from scratch and for one or the other scene but in for the dailies i think that's the important thing you're looking so long at the dailies for months and this sets so much of the tone of the of the show so getting the dp's input into the dailies more naturally from the work on set and using that metadata is a huge thing i guess yeah, I can only say from, from, from our side, um, we also have um, this workflow um, using just metadata, right? So uh, with our product Daylight on set, for instance, you can create a look on set and then you just export uh, basically the metadata. So it's OpenXR files that contain the whole grade and uh, you can actually choose much more than just a basic grading um, uh, containing uh, CDL values. You can even do shapes and uh, secondaries if you want to. And then um, you just like transport these um, uh, uh, OpenEXR files and then you can use it as a starting point. So it's not baked in, it's not rendered into the image. It's basically, um, you know, you can choose it or you can, you can modify it. You can start from new, whatever you like. So it, it provides the maximum flexibility and it gives the DOP on set uh, the opportunity to uh, be more creative if they want. I mean, I know that a lot of people on set don't have the time and you know, a lot of people just want basic um, uh, uh, grading and a basic look um, and then you can fine tune it in the finishing. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, there's different, different workflows and different options. It depends uh, what production and how much budget and all that stuff, um, but yeah. Yeah, I wanna, Thank you, uh, uh, Patrick and Sebastian. I want to now answer the other question of Nancy Riley. Uh, uh, have you experienced, experienced uh, with using these virtual backgrounds to have actors work separately on different locations? <clears throat> this actually we did before uh, virtual backgrounds came out already with green screen, but now we do it with virtual backgrounds as well. It turns out <clears throat> that uh, uh, high paid Hollywood <clears throat> actors sometimes don't like each other. So I now uh, work two times on a production where the two main actors don't really like each other and cannot be on the same set. So we filmed one on, on one location or on one day and the other one on the other day and nobody in the movie really knows that they were not in the same room. So that technology is actually uh, used before already. And this virtual production stage now makes it even easier than it was before on green screen. Yeah. <clears throat> Verena, do you have another question? Um, I want to give Nancy the chance to ask a follow up question first. Um, she's unmuted now. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Um, the reason I asked the last uh, question uh, one of the reasons, one of the main reason is that um, I've been teaching production at a film school and the middle of last semester we went online and none of the students could film their projects as planned. So we came up with an exercise where they each worked individually, put together a story, edited it, but the one thing we couldn't resolve was having two characters in the same room because even if we used a split screen the backgrounds were different is there any way that um a, a, a student could utilize this technology so that they could work because we're going online again in the fall where the whole fall semester will be online so what, um, what the ASC, the American Society of Cinematographers experiments with in the moment is they send um, camera rigs to interview partners out there for their own interview series where they have a Mac mini actually controlling the lighting, controlling the camera settings um, uh, and everything. So if you now use the light meter and your reference gray card, 
and this computer controlled lighting and camera setup, you can get the same result uh, using a green screen, for example, even, and then can have the same skin tone and the same environment there. So there are minimalistic systems out there which get which gets publicized at the moment. I, I could check if the ASC wants to share some of their findings there. That but, would be great. Um, yeah, this would be an interesting solution. Yeah, but it, it's based on using the same camera, the same camera settings and the same lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they get very good results. Yeah. Could I also add something to it too? Yeah. Um, so there is a, uh, this guy called Matt Workman who runs this YouTube channel cinematography database. Who's, uh, he's a cinematographer who's very interested in virtual productions. And I think what is really interesting is, is that he shows how basically you could create such a virtual uh, production, even at home, just having a, um, a green screen at home. And I think this is maybe a good start for students to really understand how this whole, um, how this whole system works. And you can, you know, then prepare students for the future. So that way they can already start building very simple sets in Unreal Engine, a software which is free. Everybody has a camera at home. You know, you can use your iPhone even, or you just use the characters that you have um, in Unreal Engine. And um, if you want uh, to add even more spice to it, you can get a device called Vive Pro. It's like a controller system, you know, something like an Xbox controller that can then uh, trace you in, in, in the room, in your own space. I think it's only over $100. And they, then you can become your own camera operator within that space. And all you need is that green screen, really. So you can become a camera operator, light your scene, have characters uh, either animated or you put yourself into that um, virtual space uh, with your green screen. And um, that way, if you share that world with your um, colleagues, your other students, they can, they can for example, put a, another character in there. Um, and I feel that way you can do a, sh a short film, um, very productive. And um, yeah, I would suggest maybe checking mm -hmm. out his uh, YouTube channel and learn how he does these productions. But yeah, they're very low cost. That's and, great information. Yeah, and it's a great way to just start students getting uh, them into that technology to understand what, uh, you know, they're doing on a bigger scale, such as uh, the Mandalorian. And by the way, um, we see this first meeting as a trigger to have many more meetings and follow up meetings. I think we have a subject created here right now. We could talk hours about this. And perhaps we have our GABA film production coming up soon. <laughs> um, another question um, is where um, can we see the short that was created? Is there going to be a link and when is it going to come? Yes, so um, we finished the director's cut a month ago. Uh, 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 this was already, so um, 18th of February in Palm Springs was the technology demonstration. We showed a uh, a pre-cut version already in Rec 709. There was a mini film premiere, but of course it wasn't tweaked to perfection. Now COVID-19 hits us and we said, no problem, we are in the cloud already, let's do a director's cut. And of course it wasn't no problem. We had a little glitches, it wasn't seamless right away, but we needed some time to figure it out. So Barry and the director, Stephen Shaw, did sign off on a director's cut and then Walter Valpato, who did Dunkirk and the Green Book, so he's like an Oscar winning colorist, he did um, agree to do the color finishing and this we did via Zoom and remote grading. Um, Roy Wagner, our DP, Stephen Shaw, Walter, the colorist, and I took on the job as a producer because nobody else wanted to do the job. So last week we finished it. And we now talk with different providers uh, uh, to see where we put the movie for screening. We would like to have a red carpet event of some sort because we want to 
go out with a bang, but we don't know how it's possible. Perhaps we do a virtual red carpet event. So theoretically, we are ready to release the movie. We just have to ask all the players. I mean, we have Barbara on the call and, and uh, John on the call who were with us from the beginning to the end. So we want to show the respect to everybody to take the most out of it. It was a technology presentation. I can guarantee you nobody became rich working on this project. But, but as we say in, in, in Hollywood, we don't have any money, but we make you famous. It's a famous saying in Hollywood. <laughs> so yes, it is ready. We just have to find out uh, how we show this movie. We, we, we think about a release party or something. Yeah. Perfect. And we're going to definitely um, write it in our next newsletter or whenever it's ready, um, our members will know. So sign up for the GABA Film Initiative then. Become a member, by the way. Yes, everybody. This was also perhaps our first 100% English speaking uh, uh, event. We decided we are somewhat from Germany, but we came to Hollywood for a reason. And it turns out that most people speak English in Hollywood. So we just decided to switch to English. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, hopefully we can mingle a lot in the future, everybody. So please become a member of the GABA Film Initiative team. Uh, uh, the Goethe Institute, the other uh, German partners of ours, they uh, arrange film festival, the German Current Film Festival. We, we always take part in their um, uh, uh, projects as well. So uh, thank you all for joining and hopefully there will be more. Thank you guys. Have a good rest of your day and see you soon. Bye. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye now.